Good afternoon and welcome to the seventh session of More Time for Books. This series will pause after this session as we await the Women's League Convention that takes place virtually in one month on Sunday, July 12th. I'm Vivian Lieber, Vice President of Women's League and Chair of the Women's League Reads Program. I look forward to a new year for Women's League books programs, including Women's League Reads, which will begin after convention again with new co-chairs who are Merrill Karras and Susan Farber. To join Women's League Reads, please send an email to Lois Silverman at lsilverman at wlcj.org with your sisterhood's name or your Women's League membership number. And please do join us on convention day. With us today, we have uh, exec Women's League Executive Director, Rabbi Ellen Wallens fields And we have uh, Rachel Kamen, who has been a frequent guest and a wonderful <laughs> book club, uh, all around Jewish, uh, librarian and book club leader. So um, she's going to be leading us in a discussion of book club favorites, books of Jewish interest that are both tried and true or recently published. Uh, Rachel is the director of the Joseph and May Gray Cultural and Learning Center at North Suburban Synagogue Bethel in Highland Park, Illinois. She serves as the New Jewish Fiction Award Committee on the committee of the Association of Jewish Libraries, and she facilitates several book clubs. Rachel has made several presentations during our series. She certainly has her finger on the pulse of Jewish interest literature. We also have among our members and present today, a number of Sisterhood and Region Book Club members and leaders, and that is so gratifying. If you are a chair of a book club, please, um, send me your name in, in the, um, either in the chat box or by email to V Lieber, V-L-E-E, -E, I'm sorry, V-L-E-B-E-R, it's W-L-C-J, uh, .org. I'd love to collect all those names. We hope that you will present some of your own favorites after Rachel's presentation. Uh, we're gonna keep everyone muted, but when it's your turn to speak, please unmute yourself to present a favorite book at that time. I also want to thank Barbara Ezring, Women's League Education Team Leader. She ta she's taking note of the books being mentioned in this session, and that will be shareable later if you send an email to me at V. Lieber, same address. And the chat box, of course, is available for your comment. This section session is being recorded, so now I'd like to turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Vivian. Um, I just in the chat box um, shared two PDFs. Um, um, those are the books that I'm going to be mentioning. It's a copy of my PowerPoint slides and then also a book list. So you can click on that and download and save it right now, or you can wait and, uh, you know, Vivian will email it out to you. Um, I'll make sure Vivian has it and she'll, she'll send it out, or you can contact me and I can email it to, your, to you directly. I'm happy to share. So I'm gonna share my screen so you can see the slide. Okay, so thank you so much. This has really been so much fun. I can't believe we've done seven of these. Really kudos to Vivian for all her organizing and putting all this together. It's really been a lot of fun. And I think the fact that we've had such a nice turnout um, shows how there's been so much interest in, in these sessions and it's really been my pleasure to participate in them. Um, and I just have to say, um, before I get started, I've been leading book clubs now for the last, gosh, 12 years or so. And anytime anyone compliments me on my book club leading skills, I silently in my head give all the credit to Edie Broida, who I saw was on this call. Um, she is my mentor and dear friend and everything I know about book clubs I learned from her. She was the longtime book club facilitator at Temple Israel in West Bloomfield, Michigan, when I was the librarian there right out of library school. So, so glad that Edie is here and I give her all the credit for everything I know. Um, so when I started working at North Suburban Synagogue Bethel as the director of the Cultural and Learning Center, um, the then Sisterhood Torah Fund Vice President Marilyn Lewis approached me about teaching a Sisterhood Torah Fund class. 
And I couldn't think of anything that I could teach as a weekly class. And I was a bit overwhelmed at the time with a brand new baby and a toddler at home and a part-time job at the synagogue. But I offered uh, Marilyn that I would help her start a book club. The sisterhood at Bethel at that time didn't have a book club. So in November 2009, a small but mighty group of women discussed Sarah's Key by Tatiana de Rosne. It was a big, I'm sure you all read it. It was a big book club book back in 08, uh, 09. Um, we sat around the conference table in the library at the shul on a Shabbat afternoon after Kiddush, and our Sisterhood Torah Fund book club quickly gained support and popularity. We outgrew the library conference table and had to move into the children's library. And then with 79 members and 30 to 45 participants at each of our discussions, now in our 11th year, we have to meet in the small social hall. Um, and then lately we've been on Zoom, of course. Uh, we've read and discussed over 70 books together, and the one of the things I'm most proud of and most impressed by is that 14 of our founding members are still active participants in the book club today. So what are the secrets to our success? That's what I was going to share with you today. So a couple of things about logistics if you're starting or, or trying to um, re-energize a book club. Um, when you're there's no magic day day and time for a book club. That's going to depend on your group. But I recommend keeping the same day and time for each session. Also, scheduling the meetings for 75 to 90 minutes, no more than two hours. Um, Shabbat afternoons work really well for us at Bethel, but my three other synagogue book clubs meet on weekday evenings starting at 7 or 7.30. Um, also frequency, a lot of people, um, you know, you think, oh, the book club has to meet every month. My advice is every month is very, very difficult to maintain. So I say meet four to six times between September and June and make sure that you're giving participants enough time in between the meetings to obtain the book and read the book. At least four weeks is a minimum, but I really think that six weeks between um, sessions is ideal. Um, and especially now, we were just chatting before with the public library, everyone's access to public libraries not necessarily being 100%. Um, you know, people really need enough time to get a, get a hold of the book. Um, and then also, this seems obvious, but don't meet, you know, right before the high holidays, over winter break, Passover, when everybody has other things going on. Um, about, I also like to announce the book selections with the schedule and the dates for the entire year. You can always make adjustments and changes if needed, and I, I, I have done that, but I think it's really helpful to have almost everything planned out for the year. Um, email communication and reminder notices are also really important. It's great if you have like a book club secretary who will kind of take on this job of emailing out a notice six to eight weeks in advance with the title and the date and the time of the meeting. Um, if you're, you know, doing it for your synagogue or your sisterhood, making sure it's in the congregational bulletin and the library email list and the Shabbat announcements. And then I recommend one month before you send out another notice to your book club members and then one to two weeks before send out a final reminder. Um, and then always be able to announce the date and title of the next book at, the, at that meeting. Um, I also encourage people to attend the discussion even if they haven't finished or started the book. So a lot of times at Shul people will say, oh, I'm not going to come to book club, I didn't finish the book, or I didn't start the book. I said, well, still come to book club because one of the great things about the book club is sometimes you didn't finish the book because you didn't like it and you weren't motivated to finish it. And then sometimes after the book discussion, um, you're like, oh yeah, now I'm good. I don't need to finish this book. Or, or you're more motivated to finish it. So I always tell people, come to book club even if you haven't read the book, but we will spoil the ending. You know, there's, there, we don't, we, we do, we'll have spoiler alerts in our discussion. Um, in terms of selecting, you know, the perfect book club book, um, I find that selecting new or newer books works well with my groups because most of my book club members are avid readers and they rely on book club to introduce them to new books and authors that they haven't read before. They're already reading the, the, the bestsellers and the books that have been in the New York Times and are getting a lot of buzz. So um, we try to stick with the new and the newer books. 
Um, also make sure you select books that are easily available from the public libraries, bookstores, and online booksellers. And I think a book has, it's a must that it be available as an ebook. And I think it's almost a must that it be available as an audiobook. Um, a lot of people, audiobooks are so popular right now, and a lot of people are reading, listening to audiobooks, but also as a, as a, from an access perspective, I have some members in my groups who, um, because being visually impaired, they rely on audiobooks. So I do not pick a book that's not available on audio, because I don't want to pick a book that, that people can't, somebody who is visually impaired isn't a, then able to participate. Um, paperbacks are preferable too, but again, with the ebook, it's, and the library availability, it doesn't, you know, that to me is not a deal breaker if a book is only available in hardcover. Um, the other thing as we were talking about our public libraries is submit your selections to your local public library. Many libraries have programs for book clubs. The librarians are more than happy to take your suggestions. As somebody who worked in the public library, it's a librarian's worst nightmare to have 10 people show up asking for a book you've never heard of. So they would rather know in advance that that there's gonna be a, that your book club is doing this book and they will order extra copies. In fact, our library in Highland Park was wonderful with the Bethel Book Club selections. They had, I had notified them at the beginning of the year, so they had copies on the shelf and they had e-copies, but they only had a couple of e-copies. And so during the pandemic, they bought more e-copies of our book club selections. I think they increased it to like six so that we had more access to the books. So, let your public libraries know. And also, if your synagogue has a library, coordinate with the librarian so that there can also be um, copies of the book club book at the synagogue library. Um, the other question you have to kind of decide um, is to, if, if you're going to limit your book selections to books with Jewish content. You know, there's no right or wrong answer, but you need to decide ahead of time so everybody knows, you know, is this going to be a strictly a Jewish book, book club or are you going to be open to other things? Um, and then also who's deciding the books? Is the leader deciding the books or are you doing it like de democratically? You're gonna vote on the books or everyone's gonna take turns picking the books. Um, again, there's pluses and minuses to, to those ways, um, to, to each of those ways of doing things. Um, I also, my big thing with selecting the perfect book club book is it has to be accessible. Um, so if I'm having trouble sludging through a book, I, I don't pick it for books. Um, so it has to be accessible, but it has to provoke discussion. So it's like that fine line between something you can't be too dense and too, um, you know, too heavy and too academic and not accessible, but then it can't be too fluffy that there's nothing to talk about. So it's, it's kind of finding that perfect balance. And you also don't need to find a book that everyone will like. Um, sometimes the best discussions are with books that not everybody likes. Um, and then the other rule is with few exceptions, and I, and I think I got this rule from my friend Ellen Tillman, don't pick a book that is longer than 350 pages. Um, now, there can be exceptions to that rule, but, um, and if you do pick a longer, heavier book, then allow extra time between sessions. So a great example of that, of, of when I've broken that rule is um, The Weight of Ink by Rachel Kadish. And I received an advanced reader's copy in the summer before it came out. And I didn't pick it for my book clubs for that year because it was, it's over 600 pages. And I don't like to pick books for book club that are more than 350 pages. So instead I chose an After the Fire by Lauren Belfair, which had similar themes. Um, but then The Weight of Ink won the 2018 Association of Jewish Libraries Fiction Award. It was a National Jewish Book Award book club winner and it was a Women's League Reads uh, selection and everyone was recommending the book to me. People were like, oh, I have a great book. We should do it for book club. The weight of ink, the weight of ink, the weight of ink. And I was like, okay, it's 600 pages. We'll do it. Um, so we ended up discussing it the following year and I made sure to give everyone plenty of warning and plenty of time to read it. Also, it was an already established book club book. So I knew my group and I knew that they could, they could handle it. But I wouldn't recommend picking a book like The Weight of Ink for a book club that's just starting out. If you're just starting out and trying to um, attract new members and recruit new members, don't pick a book more than 350 pages. <laughs> so the other rule I follow is don't pick a book that no one has read. 
I don't pick a book for book club that I haven't read. In fact, I don't pick a book for book club that I don't want to read twice. I'll read a book once to decide if I'm going to do it for book club, and then I'll read it twice the second time to prepare for the discussion. So if I'm not in love with a book enough to want to read it twice, it doesn't make the cut. Um, also, I'm sure many of us have had experiences where we've felt duped by that New York Times bestseller or that book that everybody's raving about, and then you read it and you're like, what? I am, this is the worst book I've ever read. So don't pick a book no one's read. Um, also choosing titles from different genres, different formats, various topics. Um, try to pick books on, you know, hot topics, but topics that are, you know, things going on in the news or subjects that most people are not familiar with that take readers to a different time or place that they've never been. You know, when you're, come, when you're and this is also the advantage of setting your calendar for the entire year, you don't want to look back and say, oh, we read all historical fiction, or we read three Holocaust books this year, or, you know, four memoirs. You want to make sure that you have what I call a varied literary diet. Um, so planning the, the books out for the year, make sure that you're that you're doing, you know, that you have enough variety. Um, and for instance, the, the year that I picked and after the fire, you know, I wouldn't do a book like and after the fire and the same time that you're doing the way to ink, you know, books that have similar themes, similar format. So try to keep variety. So um, an example of kind of that picking books that maybe on subjects that people aren't as familiar with, um, as many of us know, between 1989 and 2006, about 1.6 million Soviet Jews emigrated from the former Soviet Union, with over 325,000 migrating to the United States. And the process was not without hurdles and setbacks. And in the last several years, the children that made that momentous journey, now adults themselves, have been trying to make sense of their immigrant, immigration experiences. So more than 30 years after the end of the Cold War, there is a vibrant literary canon written by former Soviet Jews who have come of age in America. Um, Gary Steingart may be the group's founding father, but there's other writers like David Vesmosgis, who I happen to love, Boris Fishman, Maxine Schreyer, Lara Vebner. Um, but Lev Golinkin's A Backpack of Bear and Eight Crates of Vodka is one of my favorite books on this topic. Um, as Gal Beckerman wrote in his Wall Street Journal review of the book, Mr. Golinkin is among the smaller nesting doll in the ever fattening matryoshka of Soviet Jewish writers. His voice less developed than that of Gary Steingart or David Wesmoskis, but it's, but in a way it's the absence of polish that hold the book's appeal. His account is so raw and it manages to capture at a visceral level the feelings of many of the millions of Soviet Jews who left their homeland at the Cold War's end. Our book club at Bethel, this was a Spurtis one book, one community selection for the Chicago Jewish community um, back in 2014, 2015. Um, and um, I just think if you really want to understand the immigrant experience of the Soviet Jews, A Backpack and a Bear and Eight Crates of Vodka is, is the perfect book. Um, we also read um, The Betrayers by David Bezmosgis, which in a way tells the story of the 61% of Soviet Jews, or 979,000, who migrated to Israel. So a little bit, um, Bezmosgis has also written about his immigrate, immigrant experience um, to Canada, um, but The Betrayers focuses on Soviet Jews who migrated to Israel. Um, and actually, I have a short story discussion group at another local synagogue, and we discussed David Bezmosgis's uh, short story collection, Natasha. Um, so if your book club has not read a book from this generation of Jews from the former Soviet Union, I strongly encourage you to do so. Another book that um, took my book club to a time and place and historical event that most people knew nothing about um, is The Third Daughter by Talia Karner. So from the 1870s until 1939, an estimated 140,000 to 220,000 mostly Jewish girls, teenagers, and young women from Eastern Europe were coerced and kidnapped by the Zvi Migdal organization and sold into slavery and prostitution in Argentina. It, um, Talia Karner tells this brutal story through the eyes of Batya, a 14-year-old girl who is lured to Buenos Aires with the promise of a marriage to a wealthy, successful Jewish man after a pogrom devastates her shtetl. 
well-researched, well-written, heartbreaking, and hopeful, this is an important story that brings one of the most shameful and unknown chapters in Jewish history to life. Um, I led several discussions on this book, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's also fun um, to tie in, to tie your book club into a community event or a speaker or an upcoming movie release. I know Sandy Carlton's going to talk later about some uh, books that are being made into movies, good book club books that are being made into movies now. Um, but another example, so The Third Daughter, there's a documentary called The Impure um, that is also about this same topic of uh, the sex, sex slavery and Argent Jewish sex slavery and the Jewish owned brothels in Argentina, as well as what's going on today um, that you can stream um, and get a hold of. So that's a great pairing with Talia Karner's novel. Um, also, for example, last year, we had the opportunity to host a screening of the documentary film From Cairo to the Cloud at Bethel. And it's a fabulous film that tells the story of the astonishing collection of some 300,000 Jewish manuscript fragments that were found in the storeroom of the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo, the largest and most diverse collection of medieval manuscripts in the world. And the film you know, traces their remarkable odyssey to the modern world. Um, and the film tied in beautifully with the novel, The Last Watchman of, o of Old Cairo by Michael David Lucas. And that was also a Women's League Read selection and probably one of the most decorated Jewish books of 20, the 2018-2019 season. Um, it received the, let's see what it, it received the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature, which is the $100,000 prize. The American Library Association, Sophie Brody Medal, Hadassah Magazine's Rivolo Prize, and it was a 2018 National Jewish Book Award fiction winner. So it pretty much got every award. Um, so we discussed the book shortly after we had the film screening at the synagogue, and it made for a great joint program and really generated a lot of buzz. So if you can tie it into other things that are going on, whether it's the local film festival or, or you know, speakers and authors that other organizations are bringing in or that the synagogue is bringing in, that, that's always a great, a great pairing. I also try to pick a one Israeli book in translation each year. So um, like Ayala Gander Goshen's psychological thriller, Waking Lions, which was also a Women's League Read selection, her new novel, The Liar, um, also delves into the personal side of a public issue in a plot that feels ripped from the headlines. Um, in The Liar, Nofar is a painfully shy and plain girl. She's insulted by a has-been celebrity while working at the local ice cream parlor. And when he grabs her arm, she falsely inflates the occurrence into a sexual assault. Her lie puts her in the limelight, and the ensuing outpouring of public sympathy gives her newfound confidence in friends. There was some backlash in Israel when this book was, um, when this book was published. Um, but I've, I've led two amazing discussions of The Liar with book groups recently. And while many people admitted that the book made them feel uncomfortable, it made for a great discussion. And everyone agreed that Ayala Gander Goshen with Sandra Silverstone as her translator is a brilliant and gifted young writer. So I highly recommend both of her books um, for your book club. For also to add variety, I try to include one nonfiction title each year. So here are four that have been well received over the years. Um, the Family, Three Journeys into the Heart of the 20th Century. Um, David Laskin traces how his 19th century ancestors were separated by upheavals in Western Russia and went on to become the founders of the Made Form Bra Company, uh, pioneers in the birth of Israel and victims of the Holocaust. This is a highly readable, accessible nonfiction narrative, and it's one of those books that everyone loves. Um, it was, again, a Spurtis One Book, One Community. Um, and this was a book that um, attracted many of our Sisterhood Torah Fund Book Club members. Their husbands came to book club that month. Um, the author came, and it, you know, it really generated a lot of buzz, and I don't think I met anyone who did not love this book. Um, more recently, we did Abigail Pogrebin's uh, My Jewish Year, 18 Holidays, One Wandering Jew. Um, and this is a much expanded chronicle of her popular column for the foreword, when she spent 12 months researching and observing every holiday in the Jewish calendar. 
And this was our first selection last year in 2018. And I thought it was the perfect read for the high holiday season. Um, our book club usually starts right after, you know, the high holidays. Um, Mayor Shalev um, is one of Israel's most celebrated novelists. So with this, with, with his memoir, you can uh, kill two birds with one stone. You can do an Israeli writer and a, a nonfiction book. But um, he spins a charming tale of family ties, over-the-top housekeeping, and the sport of storytelling in Nahalal, Israel's first moshav. Um, My Russian grandmother and her American vacuum cleaner is a partial family memoir where um, Shalev admits that in his family, there are true stories of things that never happened. True stories of things that never happened. So that gives you a little, a, a little taste on the, the, loose, the looseness of memoir. Um, and then this past year, um, we did Danny Shapiro's um, Inheritance. And Danny Shapiro is a self-professed serial memoirist who documented her personal life in four memoirs over the course of a decade. And she thought she had become quite certain of who she was until on a whim, she took a DNA test and discovered that her beloved father was not her biological father. At age 54, she set out on a journey to discover the truth behind her conception, her paternity, and the secrets that each of her parents kept out of shame, self-protectiveness, deny and denial, and, they, and the secrets they kept in the name of love. Um, Inheritance has been a runaway bestseller. It has inspired the popular podcast, Family Secrets, which has been downloaded more than 11 million times, and is supposedly getting a movie adaptation. It inspired a great discussion with my book club this year. Something else that adds variety to our book club uh, calendar is our annual family book club. So how this came about was four years ago, the synagogue leadership challenged departments that don't typically overlap to work together on a joint program. So the library got partnered with the youth community and we had to come up with something we could do together. So we came up with the idea of a book club. So once a year, and we usually do it in February so that the kids have winter break to read the books, the Sisterhood Torah Fund Book Club turns into a family book club. We read and discuss the most recent Sydney Taylor Book Award winner, which is given annually by the Association of Jewish Libraries to the best Jewish children's books of the year. And we invite young readers and their parents to join us. The rule is that children must be accompanied by an adult, but adults do not need to be accompanied by a child. So we hold the discussion on Sunday after religious school, providing lunch for everybody. And we also have been lucky enough to Skype with the authors every year, which really enhances this wonderful multi-generational and truly special program. So I encourage everyone, whether you have children or grandchildren of your own or not, to read at least one children's book a year. I promise you, it'll make you a happier person. And the list of current and past Sydney Taylor Book Award winners is a great place to start. Um, and I actually, I recently learned that Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom um, has turned 50 this year. So I thought, oh, maybe that would be a fun book to do for Family Book Club or to revisit for a multi-generational program. Because um, as you can imagine, our, we have a very diverse group. Our Sisterhood Tour Fun Book Club is very diverse, but it's, it's women of a certain age. We tend, the age tends to skew a bit older. Um, and this way, once a year, um, the average age of the book club dramatically decreases. And it's just really wonderful to, to talk about these books with young readers. And I've gotten so much feedback from our members who don't have young children or grandchildren at home who have come to this program and just love being with other people's children and grandchildren and have just really enjoyed reading these, these children's books. So that's just something fun and different to do every year. Um, and these are, these are the four that we've done the last, the last four years. And like I said, you don't have to know anything about children's literature. You just go to the Association of Jewish Libraries, the Sydney Taylor Book Awards site, and you pick the, the book that won that year. And uh, you will not be sorry. It, it, it'll, be, it'll be a hit. Um, so talking about authors, with the Family Book Club, we were lucky enough to be able to Skype with authors. And vir so virtual author events were here before COVID-19, and I think they're here to stay. Um, so consider inviting the author to your book discussion. Go to the author's website or reach out on Facebook or Goodreads. Most authors are more than willing to talk with book groups if their schedule allows. 
I found that the best format is to discuss the book for about an hour and then invite the author to log in for the last 20 or 30 minutes via Skype or Zoom. Ask them to give a brief introduction about themselves, their journey as a writer, how they came to write the book, et cetera, and then turn it over to Q&A. Most authors will do this free of charge, but some may ask for a small honorarium or request that the members of the group purchase a copy of the book and or post a review on social media. So I mentioned the third daughter earlier and Talia Karner is more than happy to meet with book groups over Zoom and she is fabulous. Bright, personable, articulate, extremely generous with her time. She has also been doing a lot of Zoom webinars on various topics related to her novel. Um, and you can go on her website there, taliacarner.com and get all the information. Um, Rachel Kadish, um, author of The Weight of Ink, was also willing to Skype with my book groups, and she is also absolutely brilliant. And other authors who've been great to Skype with are Lauren Belfer, author of In After the Fire, which was a Women's League Read selection, Jillian Cantor. Um, I had her, we Skyped with her when we discussed The Hours Count, um, but she's come out with two new books since then, The Lost Letter and In Another Time. And then Linda cohen Lloydman, um, we Skyped with her when her book, The Two Family House, came out, and she's got another book, uh, Wartime Sisters. Um, so, and, and these, like I said, most authors I've contacted are more than willing to do this. I will say Alice Hoffman, no. Michael Chabon, no. I mean, there's certain authors that are up here that maybe are not gonna come Skype with your book club. But the majority of the authors of the books that I'm talking about um, really are just so thrilled that your book club is reading their book. Um, and if you can't line up an author to chat with you, and this is one of the drawbacks, we love our, that our book club meets on Shabbat afternoons, and there's lots and lots of advantages to that, but one of the disadvantages is that we can't do this kind of Skype or video for, on Shabbat. But um, if you can't line up an author to chat with you live, another great alternative is to provide book club members with a link to a video interview with the author to watch before the discussion or to watch during the discussion. The Women's League Reads website has links to all of the author conversations from the past years. Some of my tried and true book club selections are included, as I mentioned, in After the Fire by Lauren Belfer, uh, Waking Lions by Alec Andragoshin, The Weight of Ink by Rachel Kadish, The Last Watchman of Old Cairo by Michael David Lucas, and The Beauty Queen of Jerusalem by um, Sarit Yishai Levy. Um, yeah, here I have those all there. So you can find videos with all of those authors and many, many more authors on the Women's League Reads um, website. Now, no matter who will be leading your book club, whether it's a professional facilitator or a volunteer from the group, you need to be armed with discussion questions beyond just, you know, what you all think of the book. Luckily, discussion guides for many books are easy to find on the author's or the publisher's website or with a little Googling. Uh, discussion guides are also available from the Jewish Book Council for lots of books. So they have a whole section of their website de dedicated to book clubs. And some of my tried and true favorites that are included on the Jewish Book Council site is uh, On Division by Goldie Goldblum. And hopefully many of you were able to meet her a couple weeks ago when, um, when Women's League uh, posted her on Zoom. The Weight of Ink by Rachel Kadish. Three Floors Up by Ashkel Nebo. That's another Israeli book, also translated by Sandra Silverstone. The Best Place on Earth by Ayelet Sabari, which is a collection of short stories. Something else to consider if you wanna mix things up with your book club is do some short stories one month. Um, and The Golem and the Ginny by Helene Wecker, uh, which came out several years ago and there's supposed to be a sequel coming out, but the publication keeps getting delayed. So we've, we've, we've all been waiting for that sequel. Um, also, another great resource is the Jewish Women's Archive. They also have a, a book club and they have um, resources on their website. So um, their website features discussion guides for the Hours Count, which I mentioned with by Jillian Cantor, uh, The Marriage of Opposites by Alice Hoffman, also The Weight of Ink by Rachel Kadish, My Jewish Year by Abigail Pogerbin, and The Best Place of Earth on Earth, The Short Stories by Alice Sabari. I always think it's interesting, that's like put a star by those books. If it's a book that Women's League and the Jewish Book Council and the Jewish Women's Archives are recommending for book clubs, I think you're pretty safe, uh, safe to pick it. So I think 
Um, you know, the weight of ink is on all three of those lists. Um, best place on earth is on two of those. So you, you, you really can't go wrong with those endorsements. So um, as I mentioned, I select the books for my book club for the entire year. And my goal is always to try to have the calendar finalized by August. So here are some of the books that I've been reading recently that I'm considering for 2020, 2021. So I know a couple of my book club ladies are on this call. So I'm not promising that I'm going to pick these books, but these are the ones on my, on my short list for now. Um, the Color of Love, A Story of a Mixed Race Jewish Girl by Mara Gad. Um, at a time when many of us are searching to better understand, identify, understand, and correct racial biases and discrimination, this memoir about Mara Gad's journey as a mixed race Jewish woman is an especially important read right now. The author, in fact, will be giving a webinar sponsored by Hadassah um, next Wednesday, June 24th. Um, the Lost Shtetl by Max Gross won't be published until October, but I received an advanced copy from the, from the publisher, and, it, and it's being described as a remarkable debut novel written with the fearless imagination of Michael Chabon and the piercing humor of Gary Steingart. It's about a small Jewish village in the Polish Borscht that is secluded, and no one knows it exists until now. So it's a really clever premise that basically for 50 years, this tiny Jewish shtetl named Kreshkol has, has existed untouched and unchanged. Um, they were spared of the Holocaust and the Cold War to the extent that the people don't even know that the Holocaust happened. They're that isolated. And they have enjoyed isolated peace. But when a marriage dispute spirals out of control, Kreskel is suddenly rediscovered and brought into the 21st century. I'm about three quarters of the way through this book and I'm enjoying it immensely. It's clever and it's funny, but it is extremely thought provoking. And so be sure to look, be on the lookout for it when it's published in October. Uh, the World That We Knew by Alice Hoffman is coming out in paperback in August and she's always a crowd pleaser. But my book clubs have already discussed The Dove Keepers and The Marriage of Opposites, so I'm not sure if we need to do a third Alice Hoffman book. I know I have friends that are in book clubs that actually have it a rule that they don't read an author twice. Um, so I think my rule maybe is maybe we don't read an author three times. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Alice Hoffman's on the list because I, I really did like this book. Um, but it's also, again, people don't need me to tell them to read Alice Hoffman. So and if I like book club to introduce my readers to books they wouldn't discover on their own, that might be a reason that uh, she gets bumped off the list. We'll see. Um, the Imperfects by Amy Meyerson is a brand new book. It was just released in May. And it's about three estranged siblings who are reunited when their mysterious eccentric grandmother passes away. And they discover, hidden among her possessions, the Florentine diamond. A hundred, it's a 137 carat yellow gemstone that went missing from the Austrian empire a century ago. And that's a true story. The, the Florentine diamond has been missing for a hundred years. The rest is fiction. Um, so this of course forces these siblings to go on a quest to figure out who their, to figure out how their grandmother ended up with the world's most elusive diamond. So grandchildren, usually granddaughters going on a quest to unearth, unearth the hidden World War II secrets of their Jewish grandmother is nothing new. And in fact, I'm beginning to think it's a bit overplayed. There's been like a lot of books that have this premise. But what sets the imperfects apart is that it's not a split screen narrative. It does not go back and forth in time. Um, it, the narrative stays in the present tense. So it's, it's a little different. I'm in the middle of this audiobook right now, and it's super compelling and really enjoyable. So I've got it on the list for now. Um, Mrs. Everything by Jennifer Weiner. Um, I loved how the story unfolded through the decades, starting in the 1950s and spanning to the present day. And while this is more women's fiction than literary fiction, and we tend to do literary fiction in book club, um, I think Jennifer Weiner leaves readers with plenty of things to think about and a lot to discuss. This, this novel is a little meatier than some of her 
um, other novels and a lot meatier. Her most recent novel, Big Summer, is really a fluffy beach read. It's very enjoyable, but it's a fluffy beach read that I wouldn't use for a book club. But Mrs. Everything is, is a little more book club material. And I'm, I'm thinking of using it, especially I'm still hearing from a lot of people that it's hard to really focus on um, whoever having a hard time focusing on books and a hard time reading and really are escaping and, you know, using books as a way to escape um, and really are preferring to read lighter, easier stuff. So maybe we'll do Mrs. Everything for our first book this year. We'll see. Um, and then I just included, here are some lists that are on my, here are some books that are on my to read list. So I have not read these yet. So I do not endorse them yet, but I have them, you know, on my nightstand loaded on my Kindle. Um, and they look like they have some potential. Um, the Nesting Dolls by Alina Adams is coming out in July. Florence Adler Learn Swims Forever by Rachel Beanland, also coming out in July. A colleague of mine um, got an advanced reader's con uh, copy and she loved it. She was raving about it. Um, I Want You to Know We're Still Here by Esther Safin Fjord, the mother of Jonathan Safin Fjord. That's a memoir. Um, this looked really interesting, The Diary of a Lonely Girl by Miriam Karbalov. It was just translated from Yiddish by Jessica Kurzan, who happens to be local here in Chicago. So, um, you know, I always like to take advantage of, of local people that maybe we can bring them in. Um, and this is a, a diary from, I think, the 19 teens um, that was in Yiddish um, and is now being made available in English for the first time. So that might be something new and different to read. Um, Three by D.A. Mashani is an Israeli book, um, is an Israeli author that we haven't done for book club, so um, that one looked good. Um, the Book of V by Anna Solomon was another one that a colleague recommended. And then Becoming Eve by Abby Stein, um, My Journey from Ultra-Orthodox Rabbi to a Transgender Woman um, as, a, as a possible memoir that I've had on my nightstand. So those are my... Um, suggestions. I hope this has been helpful. I'd love to hear from you about your tried and true book club favorites. Um, you can follow me on um, Facebook and Goodreads. Um, I post all, all of the stuff that I'm reading on Goodreads. In fact, I have, a, I have different shelves. So you can go to my bookshelf, Jewish Fiction 2020, Jewish Fiction 2019, Jewish Fiction 2018. Um, and I do post my book reviews there. I also repost all of my book reviews on Facebook. So if you're not on Goodreads and you want to friend me on Facebook, you can follow me that way. Um, and my email is there. Again, I put the slides and the handouts in the chat box so you can download it from the chat box and, um, and um, do it that way. Let me see, um, people are, I'm looking now, there's all these wonderful chats. Oh, someone said, I love that you include the publication date. Well, I'm a librarian, so we're very, um, you know, we're sticklers with our annotations. Um, I always give credit to the publisher and the, and the, and the date. Um, Linda Loigman's, oh, somebody recommends uh, Linda Loigman's Wartime Sisters as a good book club book. I do too, and she's great on Skype or Zoom. Um, and, oh, someone else, yes. Um, Ayala Gondra Goshen did um, speak for at the American Jewish University. She is absolutely brilliant. And you can watch that webinar. Um, it's archived on online. Um, so this is great. Oh, people love the weight of ink. Everybody love the weight of, weight of ink. Um, oh, somebody, oh, Susan's saying she listened to the Dutch house and it was the first time she listened to an audiobook. Well, that is the perfect audiobook to start with because it's narrated by Tom Hanks and he does such a great job. Oh, there's no Jewish content in that one, but that was a great, a great one. Um, okay, great. So yes, if you scroll up to the chat, if you missed it, there are those, there are my PDF um, handouts. Um, Vivian, you want to turn it over to Sandy to share the books she was Going to yes, I would like to now introduce Sandy Carlson. She is from Congregation Chave ha Shalom Sisterhood in Rockville, Illinois. And um, let's find you, Sandy. Um, I didn't know how much time I would have. And um, these were older books, but the first one, Nightingale, which I'm sure most of you have, re you know, have read, um, which came out. 
which came out in 2015. I just, when we did historical fiction, which was, I think, the second week, this was a book that um, I had wanted to share, um, mainly because, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just an ordinary reader. Um, I belong to three book clubs. One, you know, one is um, a Jewish book club. Um, but, um, you know, as a retired school teacher, I just, you know, one of the things in my retirement that I most enjoy is being able to have time to read that I didn't have time before. But um, Chris and Hannah was done by the teacher, teacher book club um, originally, and then I shared it with my other group. But the thing about this book that got to me the most is, is the emotion and the writing. I mean, I'm not an English teacher. Um, I don't usually notice that. But um, this book, The Nightingale, if anyone hasn't read it, is um, dealing with the um, French resistance during World War II. It's, this and the boys in the boat, neither one of them are Jewish stories, but there, especially in the Nightingale, there is um, a, a Jewish presence in the book, though, even though it's not the huge thread, it's an important thread um, in the book. But when I read this book, um, it's about two sisters, uh, um, and later on, um, a fa their father and how they deal with um, the resistance differently, which, um, you know, is the same thing we've seen in like the Civil War stories um, and, and things of this nature. But um, the emotion of this book was something I had never experienced before. The end of the book for me was so powerful that I literally cried for 30 minutes. I have never had a book. I mean, you know, you'll tear up, um, you know, something of that nature. But I literally just cried. And the interesting thing about it is not the saddest part of the book. The saddest part in some ways of the book, or at least the most tragic parts, happen a, a little bit earlier in the book. So I wasn't really prepared that, you know, the ending would grab me the way it did. Um, I, um, Rachel was mentioning um, reading a book twice. I'm not one to read a book twice. As I get older and my eyes get worse, I'm a little bit more selective in what I read because, you know, um, it's not as easy for me to, to read and I'm a visual reader. I, I'm not an aud auditory learner. And, but when I read the book the second time, I thought, okay, I know the ending. I'm ready for it now. And I cried just as hard the second time as I did the first. Um, and when I went to both of the book clubs that I, we discussed this with, many of us had the same reaction. I just think, you know, it's obviously very well written. I know Kristen Hanna's written a lot of things. Um, it was supposed to come out around Christmas time. They talked about making it a movie. It was supposed to come out um, around Christmas time. And now it looks like the release is even being pushed back a little bit later um, into 2021. You know, I don't know where it was in production um, when COVID, you know, got started. It's going to be played by two real sisters, Dakota and Ellie Fanning. I, I know they're, they've done things, but I'm not particularly familiar with them, and it's the first time they've done it together. But if you have not read this book, um, I, think it's, I think it's powerful, and um, it's probably one of the best books that I personally have ever read. But uh, you know, unlike Rachel, I'm not, you know, I'm not that prolific of a reader. The other, the other one is Boys and Boys in the Boat. And as I said, I, I don't know if I mentioned, these are books that um, I don't usually read books twice, but all three of these I have read twice. Um, the Boys in the Boat, if you look at, was interesting to me, Rachel said, mentioned something about reading about something you know nothing about. I heard, I heard about this book and actually I was sitting, um, um, waiting for a play to start at the high school and people were talking about this. It's an older book. It goes back to 2013. As, as it says, it's about nine Americans and their epic quest for gold in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. This was the Jesse Owen Olympics. So um, it had that. Um, it's not particularly a Jewish story, though right before they go to the Olympics, one of the boys, the coxswain, who's one of the main leaders of the boat, though all nine of them are important, um, finds out from his father that um, he's Jewish. The father um, denies or ignores his Jewish heritage um, as he's coming, as, he's, as he comes to the United States, probably after World War I, and um, 
you know, so the boys were worried because now, you know, they were traveling with this and, you know, um, so between, there's a little bit of Jewish interest in that. Um, and, um, but again, it's about rowing, living in the Midwest. We don't have a lot of rowing teams around here. Northwestern might have one being um, on the lake, but um, for the most part, you, the rowing teams are in California, Stanford, University of California, University of Washington, and on the East Coast. So this wasn't a topic. In fact, I went to the Olympics in 1996 in Atlanta, and we had to stay far out, an hour and 40 minutes out, and was right where um, the boating the rowing was taking place and, you know, I wasn't interested. I thought, you know, I just didn't quite understand why people would come to, you know, necessarily that event and we didn't go, we didn't go to it. I'm kind of sorry now. And I did watch it. Um, I did watch rowing the last Olympics um, after reading this book. So it really took me out of, um, explored a topic that I didn't know. And the other thing about it is Daniel James Brown researched this book. It's a nonfiction book. He researched this. He when he moved out west, he happened to come across this story. I believe he lived next to um, the daughter of the, the main um, person, the main boy in the story. It's a human interest story, so that's that's kind of what got to me. Um, it also, in some ways, reminds me of Holocaust type people because um, many of these boys had very hard personal lives, um, and you know what I kind of the, the Holocaust things that I've read lately is the people who survive it, you know, what, um, what doesn't kill you makes it stronger. And that's kind of how I felt about this book um, is, you know, with, with um, the boys. And the third one is Just Mercy, or the movie is coming out. Um, it was supposed to come out in 2018, um, The Boys in the Boat. And then it was with Weinstein production and with everything happening with them. And then when it went, bank went bankrupt, um, but supposedly George Clooney um, has picked up the rights to this movie with Lantern um, Entertainment, which I guess is um, connected now with MGM. And um, as of March, it looks like they're still going to try to do it. Um, there was a PBS documentary that I watched, Boys of 36, which did a, did a good job, but it's, it's a beautifully researched and written story. And then the third one, which you know is, is more current, is Just Mercy which I believe was written in around, um, it, it was written in 2014, but the movie was just released. This is again, a topic that I would not read um, normally, um, but it's basically um, the 30 years um, of a fellow who um, went, to, a young man who wasn't, was poor, um, ended up going to a smaller college, getting into Harvard, um, his first internship, um, which he didn't really want, they sent him on um, going to a jail um, in, I believe, either Georgia, because um, some of his early work was in Georgia, Georgia, or most of his work is in Alabama, and he got hooked. And he spent the next 30 years, um, you, the, the characters in the book um, were played by um, Michael B. Jordan and James, Jamie Foxx. And um, as I said, I, ju I just saw it in January, it was released at Christmas. Um, but it's basically dealing you know, with all the racial um, situ unrest that we have now. It shows that as much as this guy has poured his whole life and soul into um, trying to um, help people, in, especially in Alabama, that um, have been unjustly accused or have gotten sentences that are way inappropriate for the crime they committed. Um, you know, 30 years later, he just turned 60, um, but you see a younger, um, Brian Stevenson in the movie and in the, and mostly in the book, um, you know, but Alabama just um, executed somebody who once again, they didn't have a lot of evidence uh, that he actually committed the trial. One thing I like about the movie too, is I read the book again after seeing the movie, the, the movie um, does stay pretty close to the book. Not everything's perfect, not every, you know, not everything's exact, but it does stay very closely to the book, which not, you know, all, not all movies do. So, um, you know, these are the, these are the three that I think in my 10 or 12 years, um, since I've been able to join book clubs that have made the biggest impression on me. Thank you. Sandy, that was terrific to hear about books that somebody loved so much that they read them to 
times and the film and then you tied it into the film. Thank you. And Rachel, that was um, something we all needed to hear your, and I don't know why we didn't do this long ago, to hear you tell us some of your, from all your experience, uh, the best way to organize and run book clubs, though I'm sure that they're the tips we heard are, are just very useful and the books you presented are familiar to some of them, very familiar and some will be new to us and very welcome additions to our reading libraries. And I've begun to have an insight in all this time with you, Rachel, on how you operate and you, you are simultaneously in, in so many places and keeping it all so well organized. I'm quite in awe of your skills. So I'd like, it's four, but I'm going to let us go just a little bit past. I don't want to cut anyone off. Before we wrap, I will take one or two quick, you know, for 60 second discussions, for, um, intros from any other book club leader or book club participant who wants to tell us about a book, a 60 second commercial. Is there anyone out there who you should unmute yourself and speak up? or you can put something in chat. Hi, Hi this is Mary. My name is Marion Tully. Can yes. I talk, Marion? Go ahead. Um, my daughter's an author and she's written a book about five years ago that has to do with a family that comes from Russia, the programs. It's called The Five Books of Moses Lipinski by Karen X. Tulchinsky. And it's at the time, of, if you've heard in Toronto of the Christy Pitts riots, it's a very good read. Another book is called Kaddish.com by Nathan Englander, if you've heard some of his books. They're quite good. Um, Maddie Friedman is an Israeli um, author, and he wrote Spies of No Country about Israel and the Pumpkin Eaters. And an, another book is... Um, the Ghost Keeper, which is also um, sort of a Holocaust book by N Natalie Noriel. And there's another one, Come Back for Me by Sharon Hart Green. We had her come to our sisterhood. She was the author and it's about a family also that he promises his sister he'll come back from her and he looks for her most of his life and, and he goes to Israel. They're all very interesting books. And uh, the other one, the last one is The German Girl. I don't know how many people have written The German Girl, which was about the, um, uh, the St. Louis and how people couldn't get off at Cuba, but this family does and all the um, anti-Semitism they felt. So it's, it's a good read. And one book I'm reading now is not Jewish, but it tells about the immigrants from Mexico called American Dirt. It's a brand new book that's worth reading. I have a slew more, but I know you're on a time schedule. So that's- Thank you. Book. Some of those books were familiar, are familiar to us, and we have spoken about them in prior <clears throat> sessions about okay. those about Israeli authors. Is there one more person that we have time for that wants to mention a book or, a book club tip. This is okay. Susan. Oh, <clears throat> it's okay. me. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm from a, a Rabbi Ellen's congregation, and we have a Meet the Author program that we do. We had scheduled um, Mamta Chowdhury for March 22nd to speak about her book, Hidden Paris. We had to cancel that, and we are now hosting that on July 30th as a Zoom event. So I'll be presenting more information about that to this group. Okay, terrific, thank you. Thank you, so Susan, we can all attend? Yeah, it's gonna I mean, be- I know I can, I'm a member there, but so I'll send it out to everybody. Yeah, we're, gonna open, we're gonna open it up to anybody that has been to our events before, or you know, we'll, we'll do a carefully screening, joining, you know, with password protection and all that to prevent Zoom bombing, but. Yes, we're going to open it up to the to the general population. Awesome. I'll I'll get it out to all of our women and thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So, 
Also, Thank Vivian, you. can I, um, I just want to make sure everybody sees, um, my colleague Lisa Silverman posted in the chat, if you lead a Jewish book club, you lead a synagogue book club or a sisterhood book club, um, get in touch with Lisa because she's trying to compile a list of, um, you know, Jewish book club facilitators and also specifically if you're doing Zoom book clubs and you're open. And you're open to the public and you're open to having other people join you. So Lisa's uh, message and her email is in the chat. She's at the American Jewish University in, in Los Angeles. Hi, Lisa. And Women's League too. We have never really compiled a complete list of book club leaders among our sisterhoods. So tell me as well, and I'll pass that on to our new co-chairs of Women's League Reads. I, with that, I would like to give our gratitude and thanks to Rachel Kamen for uh, a fabulous presentation that we'll have, the, she put into the chat box the, um, the download that we can have of all the books she mentioned. And if you miss that, you can write to me. Don't write through a group uh, forum, but privately the Lieber at WLCJ. Org. I'd also like to thank Rabbi Ellen Wollens Fields, who's done so much to Can help you us spell transition D. Lieber? to Zoom, and and also to today, Sandy Carlton. Thank you for your presentation, and to everyone who's joined us for these right. seven sessions of More Time for Books. Right. And this is an idea, although it was born of COVID, that may have legs for in the future. We can. Uh, I think it, it's been pretty successful. So with that, I'd like, I also want to give a shout out to, we do have some women today with us who are from Israel and in Israel right now, and they are among our Women's League readers and they joined us today. And uh, Diane Freakut, who is our staff person in Israel, actually um, would like me to share with you uh, that the majority women a study days of st study day is coming up June nineteenth this Sunday, and Friday. Rabbi, can you tell us? Pardon? It's this Friday. 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 I'm sorry. It's Friday, very early morning here in the U.S. Later in the day in Israel. So I have the information also how to join. Is there another channel, Rabbi, that we could through Women's League? Um, we are invited to join that study day on Zoom. Yes. So well, um, the time. It's have to very early. For, you, for East Coast US, it's about seven thirty a.m. I think so. Something like that. Yeah. So it's you can write to me, and I'll share the link, or um, I don't know if it's on our website as well. It was definitely in the Women's League this week. The Monday. Okay. Um, I don't know if the study day is being recorded. Diane's taking care of that. Diane Freed got who was on before, but she had to get off to help plan it. Vivian, did you want me to speak? Yes. Okay. Please do, and right. we will wrap up you. <laughs> um, so it has been an incredible couple of weeks doing this. I hope that even though we were all stuck in our homes in quarantine and who knows what will be in the future, that you've enjoyed doing this. Rachel came in I've heard about and I never got to experience till recently and oh my god I once I think I wrote to you once if we lived closer which we used to you'd definitely be a close friend of mine because we have a lot of interest your knowledge is incredible Sandy today thank you for leading a discussion as well Vivian your three years as our women's league reads chair as our international vice president has been incredible thank you so much who's taking I don't think oh, if anyone could take over for you and really I mentioned them at the beginning in the intro, Meryl Karras and Susan Farber. Meryl's Wonderful. from New Hampshire and Susan's from Cincinnati. And you will get to know them well, everyone. They're fabulously gifted too as book club leaders and women's league regulars. And you will um, get to meet them as we continue the Women's League Reads program. So thank you to all three of you who led today, Vivian, for all you do, our next two chairs, and Barbara Ezring, who has been our vice, international vice president for education. I know whatever your exact title is, what's your exact, what's your exact title? I'm not into titles. Team leader something. 
team okay. leader. Okay. I'm not a vice president. <laughs> you are. You were an. You were an appointee. Yes. <laughs> she'll be. She'll be our Torah fund person. So you'll all see a lot of her, and I hope that we see all of you as well. If you're not a member of Women's League yet, it's very easy to join. Either join through your own sisterhood. I'll go right on our website. On the top, it says join. You can join, become an individual member. Depending on how old you are, it's a different price. If you're military, it's a different price. It's a great way to gift people. That was the easiest gift I ever gave to my sister, was to gift her with her membership here. My aunt, so lots of people come to convention July 12th. And um, it's in Zoomberg. On Friday, you will have a wonderful couple of hours. It is worth getting up early, depending on where you live. If you're not in Israel, for everybody else, it's early. For the Masorti Women's Day of Study, Barbara Ezring's shaking her head because she's been to it too. So have I, not the one in Jerusalem, but another one. It truly shows the melting pot of Masorti conservative Judaism. Sessions are, and you pick what you want, so don't think you'll be stuck in a session in Russian that you don't know Russian. You can pick Russian, Spanish, Hebrew, English, Women from across the country usually come together because of what's going on. It is all virtual. So we in America can feel like we're in Jerusalem or wherever else they're gonna be teaching from. It's on our website, it's on our Women's League Facebook page. If you haven't friended us, you should friend us. If you haven't gotten on Facebook yet, ask the grandchild or somebody who might know how to do it. I asked my kids to help me with this stuff. Our sessions have been on, anybody watching now is probably saying, okay, enough, but this is on our Facebook page. It'll be, it's being recorded. So it'll eventually be on our website and all the slides will be there too, the list of everything. And it's really just wonderful. So thank you all. I would say it's probably not the end because a lot of us still are not going out into the wild world, but we're focusing on convention. So, Todah and stay healthy.